Now this is going to be an interesting one. Same as the last time, it's Moby Games website user speaks and it's all racing titles arranged best by year. Keep in mind that I didn't say driving, which will be quite important, especially in the first half of the list. That said, let's check out what were the most popular games in the genre throughout the DOS's history. Donkey was a racing game that was bundled with IBM PCs in the very early 80s. It was not sold separately and it was not available anywhere else than on their systems. To have it, you'd have to cough up big bucks for IBM PC. I never had an IBM, always went for the competing systems simply because they were cheaper. Come to think of it, that's beside the point really as I didn't have a PC back in 1981. I was actually really, really busy then, you know. So much so that I didn't have time for games. I was busy being born, that is. Anyway, Donkey is unusual as you're not racing against other drivers, but against yourself. It's a race of endurance and how long you can last on a long stretch of a road before dying. Said road is divided in two lanes, oddly enough both going the same way, and the only controls you really have is a space bar, which is used to change lanes. So your car is constantly cruising upwards and you have to avoid all the donkeys appearing on the screen by switching lanes. That's it. No, really. But it's the first one ever, so you gotta excuse it, the simplicity. As the time progresses and you do well, your car is moved higher and higher on the road, closer to the point where the donkeys appear to increase the difficulty. Now, I understand that Donkey is not a very good game, it wasn't one even when it released originally, but it's historically significant, as it was the first ever racing game on DOS. Should you play it? Nah, skip it, it's not worth your time today. That said, you should definitely see it. For science, you know. Race Jammer is a variation on 1979's arcade head-on. You drive your speedster on a five-lane circular track clockwise, racking up points by collecting dots, like a Pac-Man. In the same time, the opponent, controlled by CPU, is driving counterclockwise, trying to crash into you and dropping piles of junk behind randomly to stop you. Naturally, a collision with him or with a junk pile ends your game. Yep, those oldies were rather unforgiving and did not play around. If you died, you died. To avoid the opponent or his piles of trash, you can switch lanes at midpoint, so you have to do it strategically to not only avert your destruction, but also collect all the dots. And when you do, the level is completed and you move to the next one to face a stage with more dots and deal your enemy vehicle. Race Jammer may not be the best racer out there, as you're only ever racing for points and not a spot, but you are racing, that is. So it definitely deserves a spot here. Road Rally is the first real racing game of the 80s on DOS. Same as the earlier two though, it's an unusual title. I mean, most of these early games were having to substitute impossible to achieve graphics with something that would spark up interests of gamers. And so they did with interesting gameplay mechanics. In case of Road Rally, the gimmick is was that it was played entirely in turn-based text mode. Mind you, I didn't say that its graphics were in text mode. It's literally played in text. Your goal is to drive 5 mile distance from your home to the old mill stream. There are 5 courses in the game, from easy straight all the way to the curvy bendy challenging one, and you can pick one of the 4 available vehicles to race in. A Volkswagen, a Chevrolet, Mazda RX-7 and a Ferrari. Now, naturally in other racers most would just go for the fastest car, it's a recipe for success after all, right? Well, not really, cause in Road Rally each of the cars only has a half gallon of gasoline, and the faster the car, the more it will burn. So you will have to manage your fuel consumption by choosing the appropriate speed at every turn. Turn that represents 10 seconds of real life time. So each and every turn you have to pick the speed from minus 10 to 10, where minus 10 is handbraking and 10 is hard acceleration. A pedal to the metal, so to speak. And it's the only means of control you get in Road Rally. Don't let it fool you though, it will be fast and action packed and you will be adjusting the speed before, during and after each turn, navigating the curves like a boss and avoiding crashes like a real pro. All the while keeping your engine from overheating and your tank from emptying. After a while, that is, cause in the first few races you'll do really, really poorly. But don't worry, everyone does. A little time and practice though, and you'll learn to appreciate Road Rally. Computer Circus Maximus is another racer that you don't take a direct part in, issuing orders each turn and another one that doesn't suffer because of it at all. In fact, it makes it more fun. It's Roman Empire's prime time and you're one of the famous or soon to be famous racers. Darius the Hasty, Oli the Fast, Bruce the Bat, Bolo the Young or any other you decide to name yourself after. You can design your own chariot using points, balancing speed, endurance and its strength while keeping driver's skill in mind and you compete against up to 11 human or CPU controlled drivers. So strategies of picking up light but fast cars or strong but sturdy are equally as viable if you know what you're doing. 
Every turn you get a summary of your chariot status, horse's strength, speed and endurance and you get to issue order for the turn to follow. So you need to balance when to push and when to hold back, making sure not to exhaust your horses and in the same time not to lose because you were resting them too much. Unlike Road Rally however, results of your choices are not text based but displayed using animations. Now, I get that Roman setting may not be for everyone, personally I'm not a fan either, but the gameplay can definitely stand on its own and Computer Circus Maximus deserves to be seen, played and remembered. And I think that that would really enjoy a modern turn based racing game because it seems like a lot of fun. I played the board one few weeks ago and it was a hoot. It's not a place or time for it here though, so let's jump into our next title. Palloon Racer is not an easy game, especially that it's an earlier racing simulation from the early 80s. The gameplay is viewed from the first person perspective with a cockpit view on top of it, displaying your plane's current settings and status. Your task is to complete a lap around the course as quickly as possible. While the 3D rendering tech for the time was rather impressive on PC, it didn't age too well. And Palloon Racer is the only one of the games I've spoke about today so far that I would find annoying to come back to. It's slow, it's not great looking, utilizing incredibly basic 3D, and I don't think I ever gave it more than 15 minutes of my time even back in the day. If you like simulations, you may enjoy this one for what it is, especially that from the inner workings mechanics point of view, there is nothing wrong with it. I just don't find it very fun to slowly crawl around the sky, around the aerial racing track. Oh, interestingly enough, if you and a friend both had the game and modems, you could either race online against each other or play sorta air laser tag in Python Racer. Still not my cup of tea, but could be fun for others. The American Challenge Sailing Simulation sports an era-appropriate CGA graphics and a rather robust for its time 3D sailing engine. And it's another title I overlooked in the past because of the pace that it runs at, and because by the time I had a PC it was ancient. It features 8 different sailing courses and sees you steering the boat against CPU opponents to victory. I believe that I mentioned it a minute or two ago, but I'm not big on very early and super slow 3D. Same as Pylon Racer though, it too allows for an online modem based multiplayer. You control your sails, rudder and centerboard, keeping wind speed and direction in mind, and adjusting your settings accordingly. Given how close to life your sailboat moves, American Challenge was a quite a popular title at the time, at least within the sailing crowd, and was praised for its realism and fun factor. Now, I don't sail, I would drown like a rock if I fell off board, so I can't judge the realism here. And fun is not something I experience in single digit FPS games. I know, I know, I've been spoiled by the latest 30 years of development and advances in technologies, but that's how I really feel. Early 3D is not my thing. At least slow and choppy early 3D isn't. When Test Drive came out it shook the world. Literally. I remember feeling the ground trembling running to my windows looking for what might have caused it and finding nothing. Nada. And no later than a week or two after I went to my friend's place and he was playing Test Drive. At the moment I instantly knew that it was the reason for the earlier commotion. That somehow these two occurrences connected and the shakes were universe's response to a gaming revolution in the making. The quake was a sign. On the other hand I might have imagined it all and there were no quakes anywhere around back then especially that I lived nowhere near the edges of tectonic plates. Still Test Drive did shook the world as it was first, for the lack of a better word, semi-realistic driving simulation. On C64, DOS, Amiga and any other platform it came out on. It featured 3 d filling environments and close to life road traffic. I mean sure it could be argued that its roads were rather empty, but early 80s were different times. And most of the racing took place on remote routes in the US. Test Drive might have not run the best, but the graphics it offered at the time felt photorealistic to most of us. Very little heavy specifications for available cars and impressively rendered side views of this in the menus sparked my childhood imagination and made me feel as if I could really drive one of these beasts. I couldn't, cause as soon as I tried I quickly realized that constantly breaking windscreen is not the experience I was looking for. Obviously I'm exaggerating a little, but in reality Test Drive was neither simulation nor an arcade racer. It was something in between and was just ok, at best. Despite that however it was incredibly important in history of gaming because without it we wouldn't get Test Drive 2 and basically most other modern racing simulations. And also it took the cake for the best racer in 1987 according to Moby Games users, so clearly I must be wrong about it. Grand Prix Circuit is a Formula 1 racing simulator that actually unlike most other games in 1988 was developed for PC first and then ported to other systems. And it shows, cause maybe apart from the Amiga outing that came a year later, DOS version is the best of the bunch. It looks as good as games can using EGA graphics and runs butter smooth. 
provided you run it on at least 286 or even better 386 CPU and not on minimal required configuration. Grand Prix Circuit offers three different cars to choose, McLaren being the fastest of all, Ferrari the easiest to handle and Williams sitting somewhere in between. And there are a total of eight real-life tracks from all around the world, with Silverstone in Britain and Circuit de Monaco from Monaco being the most notable ones. It's a fun and frantic racer that requires a bit getting used to, but eventually is quite rewarding if you like racing games that is. It can be enjoyed in a single race mode or in full championship in which you tackle all the tracks available in the game in order for points. Rival drivers all have their own unique styles of racing, strengths and weaknesses and figuring this out is a recipe for success. Having that Grand Prix circuit made the right call opting to stay in 2D rather than jumping prematurely onto the 3D bandwagon, as by 1988 it was still crawling and 2D with a little care put to it could look much better, convincing and run really smooth too. While generally speaking I prefer my arcade racers to simulations, Grand Prix circuit is really fun and even I enjoyed it at the time. In the Annapolis 500 the simulation is true to its typo. It really is a simulation first and foremost and racing game second. So, it represents the famous American annually held race with attention to detail unlike any other game could provide at the time. The number of options you can change to customize your car is staggering for the time it released in and something that no other dev than Papyrus attempted in such a degree for the next few years either. You can adjust wing downforce, inner and outer tire pressures, spoilers, wheel stagger, amount of fuel in the tank and turbo output among others. And any and all options that you change actually make the car feel and perform different during races. To the point that you could spend more time theorizing how to set up your car to perform best than actually racing. I'm exaggerating a little but only to highlight the depth the devs went into with Indy 500. Even seemingly small and insignificant changes could help you shave off fractions of a second for each optimization and when you add them all up, a few seconds is huge in racing. The graphics are all 3D and not an early chunky bulky and unpleasant 3D I mentioned before with few earlier games, but a proper, nice looking and smooth running one. Sure, they may not be texture mapped, but for 1989 it was beyond state of art and something unseen in any other games. If that wasn't enough, the underlying physics engine was excellent too, simulating everything happening on the track with pinpoint accuracy. I mean, you could feel, for the lack of a better word, how your car would behave under different conditions, when overtaking after tailing the opponent, when cornering too fast, with centrifugal force pushing you to the outside, it's an experience. Or it was an experience. Cause while Indy 500 was a benchmark for games to come, along with technological improvements, new titles that emerged over the next few years bettered the formula. All in all, for its time, it had no competition and was the best. Check it out. Stance is a 3D racing game, and as the title may have given away with the single word that it is, it's all about stunts. You swoop around the chosen from the built-in set or a custom created track with the aim of completing the lap as fast as possible without crashing. It's not always as easy as it seems, as some of the stages, especially created by users, can be real nightmares to drive on. Or even worse, seemingly simple straights and turns that give you fake feeling of being in control with a neatly hidden jump or ramp that approached at the wrong speed or angle would total your vehicle instantly. Player's imagination has no bounds really. And since there's hundreds if not thousands of tracks available online, there's hardly the end to the nightmare. I mean, obviously there's hardly an end to the endless fun that stance provides. Yep, 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 that's what I meant. You can race against the clock or CPU control drivers, there's 11 different in specs filling and handling cars to choose from and a whole plethora of various ramps, loops, jumps and other features to crash around on. And back in the day, two buddies of mine and I used to not only race on included tracks but even spent hours at home creating our own from ground up just to then meet up and challenge each other on our own creations. Stunts that clearly could have aged a bit better than it did when it comes to its presentation is still really fun to speed around in. Even though it's not a simulation, it doesn't feature realistic damage or weather conditions, it's hella entertaining to play against friends, competing for the best times on tracks that you imagine and create yourselves. Especially when drinks are involved and all of you like racers at least a bit. Naturally, I meant soft drinks as I wouldn't like to upset YouTube algorithm again. To summarize, with surprisingly easy and fun to use track editor, easy to pick up and play gameplay formula, Stance is nearly infinitely enjoyable even today. Street Road 2 is a victim of a first Street Road success. On one hand, it's more of the same, so more cars, more parts and possibilities of upgrading and rebuilding them, and more races. On the other, developers clearly wanted to change and improve the worst part of the first game, so racing. And they did. But it didn't end up being better. It's actually a bit worse. It may have been the weakest part of the first title, it's even more broken in Street Road 2. 
The races are slower than before, but much more chaotic even if controls themselves are tad tighter and it's considerably easier to crash in them. Which, you know, wouldn't be a big deal if the races weren't for casual pink slips. I have a very mixed feeling about Street Road 2. I really like the improvements, but what was broken, even more than it already was, makes it borderline unplayable to me. Still, if you're interested despite that, the gameplay formula is same as previously, so you buy cars, repair and customize them and finally raise the opponents for money or pink slips. So cars, if you're not versed in the jargon. The story goal of the game, because of course there is one, is to beat the existing king of the free racing courses. And naturally, he's driving the best and fastest cars, so it will take a while. If you do, however, you're not only going to become the new king of the road, but will also get his girl. Which is all sorts of weird and brings to my mind many things to say about the girl, none of them are good, if she's just going for whomever is currently quote unquote the best. She may be a definition of a gold digger. Never mind. Point is, the car repair and customization options are better and deeper than previously, but racing is as disappointing as it was. Don't get me wrong though, you can get used to it and enjoy it eventually too, it just takes a lot of work to do. And I don't think that games should require you to work to enjoy them. Formula 1 Grand Prix aka World Circuit is one of the best if not the best F1 simulation racer of the early 90s and the first game in Jeff Cramon's famous Grand Prix series. It features all 16 official international GP circuits and the 18 teams with 35 drivers based on 1991 season. And while the names of the drivers are not real, because of the licensing issues, they can be easily edited by hand in game. The three game modes available are Quick Race, Single Race and Full Championships and they are exactly what their names state. What Formula 1 GP was best known for though, was the customization that allowed you to adjust and tune many of the car's features, changing its on-track behavior and performance alike. So stuff like wing downforce, tires, gear ratios or even brake balance to name a few. There are also 6 additional rookie-friendly options that make the gameplay less simulation-y for the lack of a better word and more arcade feeling. Auto gears, auto brakes, self-writing spins and others. They are not necessary in a racing simulation, but a nice gesture towards less proficient gamers and those who don't care much for realism. If that wasn't enough, World Circuit is played in full 3D, features working rear-view mirrors, collisions with other cars and debris, crude damage model and different weather conditions that influence how cars behave on the track. All that put together makes for an incredibly enjoyable gameplay, especially if you're a fan of F1. And I have a confession to make here, I don't care for F1 as a sport. And to be frank, I don't care about sports in general. They're just not my thing. But despite that, I actually always found World Circuit fun, even if I wasn't very good at it. IndyCar Racing is Papyrus's second game after earlier Indy 500 that we spoke about a few minutes ago, and for the most part it can be considered to be a better version of the first title. It's also better than Formula 1 Grand Prix I've just mentioned, even if covering a different offshoot of the sport. It's set a standard for all the simulation racing games to come. It features 8 circuits for individual racing or as a part of championship and a selection of contemporary chassis and engines. With two expansion packs released later, seven new tracks were added for a total of 15, in famous forgotten indie speedway included. Most drivers of real-life 1993 season short of Nigel Mansell were included, and the comprehensive garage feature allowing you to customize the cars before races was better than ever. Racing physics was a step up from anything that came before too, allowing for implementation of various based-in-life racing techniques, based on grip, ideal racing lines and throttle-to-brake interaction. Damage model was rather good too, with bits and pieces flying off after collisions and components failing and such. All that put together made IndyCar racing a really difficult game. And I don't mean difficult as in it will take you a while to win races. I mean so demanding that you will have to fail numerous times before you even start completing races, not to mention winning. Which you know, for some it may be disheartening, but on the flip side, it was a decent simulation of what would really happen if you were to jump in an IndyCar racing bullet and start competing, assuming you wouldn't die in the process that is. So it would take a while before you complete the race, not to mention place in any noticeable spot. IndyCar racing's graphics are phenomenal. Yes, are, not where. Sure, they can't compare to modern games when it comes to fidelity, depth and effects, but they wouldn't look fugly and you wouldn't be disappointed if you'd play it today. Texture mapping, car models, real life tracks and even the ad placement are all fantastic and as realistic as it was possible to achieve in 1993. And Papyrus has truly crafted a masterpiece that was beloved and favorite of many racing fans until the release of its second outing or... NASCAR Racing was groundbreaking when it came out. Following their previous game in the car racing, Papyrus perfected the formula with this one. Sure, in the car bullets may have not much to do with those found in NASCAR, but the engine and the tech used for the first game was expanded and polished for the second. Well, technically the third, but you know what I mean. 
This time, open-wheeled cars were dropped for closed cockpit stock cars, and everything that made the previous title amazing was rehashed and polished for this one, resulting in even more satisfying experience. So, the graphics got a considerable bump to high-res SVGA, with all the real-life cars, trucks and everything around them looking crisper and running smoother than before. Well, provided you had a system capable of handling it all at fast pace. And previously introduced customization slash tuning system and damage models were expanded considerably too. Centrifugal force, drifting, collisions and even drafting, which was a new addition to the games if I'm not wrong, were all in and simulated accurately and realistically, making for an action-packed and fun experience which despite being a simulation at heart was more approachable and easier to get into than IndyCar could ever be. Especially that a whole slew of options allowing NASCAR to be tweaked to individual gamers' skill levels was added making it a very customizable title. Good for all, Sunday racers and hardcore NASCAR fanatics. The only problem that NASCAR had upon its release were the hardware requirements, as hardly any system on the market could run it at full pace with all graphical options enabled. And today, it's not the easiest one to emulate either, so tweaking it to work may take a minute. That said, it's worth it. So if you get a chance and slash or love racing games, make sure to give it a go. When I launched Need for Speed first, I was instantly hooked, long before I even played it. The intro, man, all those supercars, those I dream of having or just even driving, to be quite honest here with you, hailing from a small town, even seeing one would be great. And there they were, on my screen, in Hollywood quality fast-paced full motion video sequences, seducing me to launch the game. And boy oh boy I did. And Need for Speed did not fail to deliver. I don't think that I've ever seen as realistic graphics in a racing game before, and I know that I've spoke about few of those awesome games today, but presentation-wise, none could hold a candle to it. It's not that they were in a different league, they were not even playing the same sport. Come to think of it, I've misspoke. It's not that I don't think, I know I haven't seen anything comparable in quality. So, naturally, being as impressionable teen as I was, I was instantly charmed and hooked, both at the same time and at once. All tracks and cars looked as if they were real. Just miniaturized to fit on my 15-inch flickering screen and switch into steering wheel view made me feel as if I was really there too, rushing through beautiful sceneries in ungodly fast monsters against equally as fast opponents. Each of the available cars varied in how they felt when driving, offering not only different parameters on paper, well, screen, but you get what I mean, but also how they actually handled. Each also had their own distinctive sounds, hums and purrs of the engine, so to speak, so if you played Need for Speed long enough, you could actually tell which car was approaching you from behind based on the sound alone. And music, hard rock tracks all throughout. And all pumping the adrenaline through your veins nearly as fast as the racing itself did. But most of all, Need for Speed landed itself in a very comfortable spot of being neither simulation nor pure arcade racer. It was somewhere in between, where fans of either subgenre could enjoy it. If there's anything, one thing even that I would like to complain about, it would have to be lack of any in-game damage model, which given everything else that Need for Speed does well, is still not enough to take away the big W it was in 1995, and in my books. Grand Prix 2 is a F1 racing simulator and a worthy successor to JF Cramon's classic world circuit. It features a full FIA license, meaning you get to race against the legendary drivers of the time, Michael Schumacher, Damon Hill and Mika Hakkinen to name a few, and it was the closest thing to a real F1 that most gamers could realistically ever expect to happen to them. The underlying driving physics engine is actually really good and responds accurately to all the changes you make to your car, and that's where the beauty of this game lies. Now, I am not a car fanatic and don't claim to be knowledgeable when it comes to tuning in any real way, but despite that, I can tell you that any and all modifications that you make to your car's brake bias, g ratios, wings, sway bars, packers, springs and damper can be felt when driving and impact a performance and handling in noticeable way. It may shave off just a tiny bit of your lap time, but together, when set up correctly, this can make a difference that will put you ahead of the competition. You know, same as it is in F1 in real life. And since we're on how the game feels, I can't omit the presentation. It's fantastic. Not good or great. Fantastic. Sure, when compared to games of today, it looks blunt and blocky, but in 1996 it was something else. I mean, take a look at replays if you get a chance. They look so good that on a small 15-inch CRT it could be argued that the game was close to being photorealistic. And it is the only title in this video that I can comfortably say that it gave Need for Speed brand for its money presentation-wise. Grand Prix 2 set a new standard for F1 simulations in 1996, and it was one that the others had to strive to compare themselves to. If you're a fan of the sport, it's not only the best racer of 1996, but also a must-have.
Carmageddon is what Armageddon with Bruce Willis is based on. Cars being shot into space with kamikaze drivers aiming themselves into a comet in an act of desperation to save humanity at the cost of their own lives. Or was it Fast and Furious? It's equally as plausible. Only not really and not at all. Carmageddon, same as its successor released a year later, is one of the best arcade over-the-top racers ever made. It's a natural evolution of races like supercars, death rally or destruction derby, but using more advanced 3D engine and even more brutality all throughout than ever before. In a sense, the races are theoretically identical to those in any other game in the genre, meaning you can win them by just completing a certain number of laps and coming up first, before any of your opponents does. But that's not what this game is all about and there are two other winning conditions, both more fun and more likely what you'll be aiming to achieve on each track. So you can also win by incapacitating all pedestrians, which is easier said than done, as there can be even upwards of 500 of these per track, or, and that's the goal most aimed for, you can destroy all other cars. Each race has a certain set time to complete either of the goals, but you can extend it by running over the pedestrians or damaging your opponent's cars. It's a simple yet enjoyable formula that hardly ever gets old and the game is now infinitely replayable. Especially that all 36 tracks included are really well designed too, often open form and full of secret passages, jumps and hills, so that even if racing only, you inevitably end up performing tricks whether you aimed to or not. And land on other cars, ramming into them at high speed or splashing a passerby here and there. Preferably all the time and everywhere. But wait, that's not all. There are also numerous active and passive power-ups that can affect your car, your opponents or even pedestrians and all come with their own sets of bonuses if used correctly. If you like Destruction Derby, Carmageddon with its dynamic damage system and addictive gameplay will be a dream come true for you. And a title that many game users picked for the best DOS racer of 1997. Ooh, what a ride! I gotta say that I'm a bit disappointed that Screamer 2 didn't end up taking the spot here. But you know, it's not my list, it's the world's list. So it is what it is. What do you think of it though? Any games you'd like to swap for something else? Or maybe it's spot on? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.